and welcome to this episode of the Akad and Coca Report. We are very happy to have Aiden and Emily Akanayake today. Um, they are here to tell us about um, their firsthand experience um, with um, myocarditis. Um, uh, I met Emily on Twitter. Em Emily's been a big time advocate for um, uh, raising the profile of um, this particular adverse event that uh, you know, uh, you know, some people with who have taken the vaccine have faced, and in this particular case, it was Emily's son, Aiden, who is also here and joining us. So, thank you both for uh, spending some of your precious evening with us. Thank you for having us. <laughs> yes. So, Aiden, we'll start off with you. Tell me, um, tell me what you remember about. Um, uh, the, you know, about what happened. Uh, you, you were, you had a, you were vaccinated, you, you were, you, you know, you, you, you made the decision to get vaccinated. Your mom said yes. it was a good idea. How did that, how did that all go down? So, uh, my parents certainly were for it, but I think I wanted it a lot as well, like of my own personal volition. Cause like just the freedom of being able to go out. Cause I'm already kind of high risk. I have asthma that flares up, especially with illnesses. Mm -hmm. So uh, I couldn't, we were pretty much stuck in the home because my brother also has it. So we have to be careful. Oh, I see. I see. And so um, when was this? What, what, when, when was the, when, remind me when the vaccine was uh, finally available to, to So you? Uh, I believe I got my first dose in the end of May, pretty much towards the beginning. I'm not exactly sure on like the time it started, but seems around that time, May okay. of last year. May last year. May tenth. Okay. May tenth. Okay. So that was the first dose or the second dose. Yes. Okay. First dose. So, first dose is May tenth. And how'd you feel after that? Uh, nothing wrong in retrospect. It was like a bit of tingling, but like never would have noticed it if it was if it was just that dose and that was it. Okay. It's like sometimes you can look back and then see things. Oh, that's a red flag. I see. But I didn't notice it in the beginning. I gotta um, say. Yeah. I got to say, Aiden, um, I'm going to, as a, as a tangent, me and Michelle have to really up our, uh, our seat game here for this podcast. I mean, you're, <laughs> you're like, you're totally putting us to shame with that awesome uh, gaming, gaming seat that you have. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, okay, so you got the vaccine and then, you know, and of course it was a two shot thing. So, yeah. oh, where did you get it? Did you get it at a doctor's office? Did you get it? Uh, I don't, it was not a doctor's office. It was at a park, I believe, just an official like government giving them out. I don't know. Okay. My mom could confirm. I, I'm not entirely sure on that. But it definitely wasn't a doctor's office. It was outside like a um, I don't know the location's name. Mom, do you? Yes, it was at a mass vaccination site. It, he's okay. right, a park that they had converted okay. into one. Yeah. So who and how did they talk? Did they did, did you did they talk to and you know, mom? You were with Aiden, I, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and what did did anyone talk to you? I mean, I guess you signed some consent form or something like that. Correct. Yeah. Um. So it was very much like a rapid. You go. You go. Uh, I believe you get a form towards the beginning or you do it prior you hand it in uh and then it's a drive-by vaccine so what they'll do is they'll just pull down your window they'll vaccinate you so it's very much quick okay. and then you're out of there so, mom did you remember anyone talking to you about risks benefits or uh anything no I, that, so I, it wasn't discussed yeah, I, I ran a I ran a vaccine clinic, um, and this was in uh, early March in in Philadelphia, where, where I am. And uh, we had these Saturday clinics, and we had volunteers come in, and it was really quite exciting to be able to have. And we had the Moder no, we had the yeah, we had the Moderna vaccine, and um, all that we have to do from a provider standpoint um, is provide um, uh, provide the FDA EUA there for. Um, uh, patients, if they want it, to review. So I actually, my I took my 14-year-old and my 12-year-old in to help me. Um, so they were registering patients, and uh, and so you know, so they had a they had a they had a stack of paper, a stack of papers with the FDA EUA, and I you know told my 14-year-old, I hope this was legal. <laughs> I told my 14-year-old that you know as they as you're telling people, uh, as people are checking in. 
to let them know that um, hey, th there's this is the FDA UA, uh, this is the FDA packet to review if you'd like for questions about the vaccine. If you if you have additional questions, obviously don't ask me. I'm 14. You know, direct them to my dad who's upstairs, right? So they were checking people in in the in the lobby downstairs because the building doors were closed on the on the weekend, so they had to let people in. And so I figured they could check them in as well. So. Um, so that's that. That's really all. And I remember um, folks asking. Uh, there are very few folks that asked me about risks and benefits. And I basically, at the time, this was March of 2021, right? Um, uh, and I basically said, you know, the vaccines, as far as we know, from the data we have, are incredibly safe. We have not seen any significant uh, serious side effects that we have been able to note as of as of yet and so but but the, the vast majority of folks didn't ask anything so the vast majority of folks i think were like you they were like here I'll roll up my arm get the vaccine you know let's all let's all end the end the pandemic uh, you know once and for all so um so so you you folks were actually later on you're in the you were in may 2020 and so interestingly enough the first reports that i as a cardiologist kind of saw of there being an issue, of there being any adverse events that were, you know, that were that were significant, um, was the reports of myocarditis from Israel um, in April. I think it was late April of 2020. So that's the first that I heard of it, right? And the thing that made me and some other cardiologists concerned, in terms of, you know, how do you how do you tell? You're you're vaccinating millions and millions and millions of people, like. There's going to be randomly people that have heart attacks after vaccines. There are going to be people that have strokes. There are going to be people that have miscarriages. All these things are going to are going to start happening. So how can you tell whether or not it's related to the vaccine or not? So it really requires some like careful sorting. But here's the interesting thing: when you're giving two doses, right? If if the if if the um, if it is random, the events that are happening after the first dose should the event rate should be about the same as happening after the second dose, right? So the real concerning thing that we noticed in April, or at least some cardiologists noticed in April, this is all actually based on a internal medicine doctor who had a case of myocarditis that he saw in Israel, in Hadassah, the, the medical uh, uh, school out there. And he noticed this case of myocarditis, then he started asking around, and he noticed multiple cases of myocarditis after, after the vaccine. And that's based on that, Israel, Israel did, a, did a larger study and said, hey, look at this. We're seeing rates of myocarditis, and importantly enough, um, the rates seem to be much higher after the second dose, which is why you kind of can link together and be like, "Oh my goodness, this could be something causal. The vaccine may be causing it. It not. It mean it's not just a coincidence that that the vaccine is given and then you develop myocarditis, right? So, so by actually by May of 2020, when you you had your that was your first dose, right? By then, there were some cardiologists that are out there, and Israel had reported this thing um, that had reported that. You, but you, you had not heard of this, uh, I imagine. I had actually. Oh, you had. Interesting. <laughs> I told him about it, and um, wow, they they think that I am um, OCD and worry too much. I said, if you have chest pain, you need to tell me. And ironically, he joked about it the next day. And then the following morning, he woke me up saying, Mom, I have chest pain. This was the second dose, not the, the second first dose. dose. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Oh, boy. Where, so can I ask uh, ask you, Emily, where did you hear about it? Uh, I was reading the Israel studies, actually. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Um, but, you know, I was taking it yeah. with a grain of salt. It was new, and I knew people that were getting vaccinated, and everybody seemed to be doing fine. Yeah. I was watching it, obviously, and was aware and um, thinking about it. And I actually called our pediatrician because I had seen those studies, too. And um, she said she recommended it and we went with it. So, yeah, yeah. No, yeah right. And, and, and again, Aiden is a higher risk because he's had, you know, asthma triggers and, and whatnot. And uh, and, you know, uh, yeah, so. So, okay, so you get that second shot. So May, so was it June by the time you got that second shot? Uh, yeah, so it was the next month. It got delayed a bit. Okay, all right. Uh, can I ask how delayed it was? Do you remember when, when the date was? I think it was like June uh, 10th, 13th-ish. It was the 10th. Okay. okay. So it was I about... Got it was a full month practically okay. so four weeks the recommendation i think was 21 days or something like that or 23 days or i forget what exactly the number but uh but you had you about 30 days later you got your second dose and this was moderna or pfizer by the way i forgot to ask pfizer yeah. pfizer okay so you got your second dose 
and uh, this drive it was the drive through thing again and everything was exact fine. same thing exact same place uh, okay. it, was, it was just normal okay. felt normal they no did it quickly okay. and then so next day again this is in retrospect although i did notice definitely more it was like uh I think similar, I don't suffer from bad allergies, just asthma, but similar to asthma, it's like a tingling, ticklish, but kind of like a bit hurting in my lungs. It's so like I breathe in. It, I thought it was asthma or something because the, all the chest pain felt similar to asthma because I've always had that. I haven't had any heart complications prior, so it's the closest thing. But uh, each breath, it felt like kind of like, allergies almost little it kept hurting with each breath so very slightly in the beginning first day so the first day with taking deep breaths you started feeling you you noticed some pain but it was yeah. pretty mild and didn't really mild up. yeah like i could i could be doing something just completely forget it's just okay. something like if you have like a small cut for example sure. uh it, it would be like that almost but definitely worse but just okay. where you can forget it at least and that day not like at night right and and then what happened did the, did the, the night did the night go okay the next morning when did so, when did you really start feeling i believe falling asleep so this must have been like 10 11 ish since it was break um i fell asleep pretty normally but i woke up at like 12 one ish and it was just like every breath deeper in was like knives in my chest so like, uh, what was peculiar is that if I took a bigger breath, it hurt less than doing small and shallow breaths. So I kind of just uh, like tested the wires for like 30 minutes. It really sucked, especially since I was trying to sleep. Definitely hurt a lot. And um, I was able to do where, find a tempo where it was like small breaths, not as much pain, which is a very odd thing in retrospect, but uh i was able to fall back asleep woke up at like four ish and then got my mom up because i was i was still contemplating if it was the myocarditis or not because again i didn't know how it would feel per se just like chest pain is pretty broad especially when you have asthma and so i thought like heartburn or something i got my mom up and was like uh could i have heartburn medicine and then i believe i had we tested heartburn medication, Motrin in my inhaler. Um, the Motrin ended up working. So I didn't feel as, I didn't feel pain that much, but my parents decided at like nine, six, uh, I eight, I'd say to take me to the hospital. They both been, uh, agreed. And that's where I got checked up. So how would you say it was pretty i guess it woke you up from sleep right i mean you're not normally up yeah. at 4 a.m so it was pretty it was um, yeah it i mean the worst the worst pain yeah. that you've ever had in your life or like you know hard to say because i've torn my acl before mm -hmm. so that's that much more painful pretty, yeah <laughs> although it was on similar levels for sure okay so it was pretty painful enough so mom yes. and, and 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 actually you were kind of you kind of knew what you were, um, Aiden, you were kind of what the possibilities may be because your mom had already raised this issue of my Yes, I thought it was one of her. She's very much like a uh, any problem could be the problem. Like, remember, we sometimes slam, swam in our grandpa's wake and it's like if water got into your nose, that's brain eating amoeba. So I was just playing it off. <laughs> Because it's very <laughs> stop yeah. it, Aiden. <laughs> Throwing mom under the bus, just like every good fourteen-year-old should do. I love it. All right. <laughs> so, so all right. So, so mom, how did you and dad um, kind of decide? Uh, were you like, well, the Motrin made it better. Maybe we should just sit at home, not worry about it. What made you decide to take him to, you know, get evaluated further? I I knew. I, I mean. I, I just knew what it was. I felt like I knew what it was right away. He, I think Aiden kind of knew too. Um, the Motrin didn't comfort me. It comforted his pain. That's it. It didn't comfort my anxiety. Uh, we just decided, you know, it's time to go in. It, this yeah. isn't going away. 
um, it was, he still had subtle pain okay. and, uh, it, yeah, it wasn't okay. something we were just going to wait around and see what happened. Yeah, no. And, and, and this is really, I mean, myocarditis is, is, is something that is serious. Um, it's, it's inflammation of the heart muscle that actually results in some damage to the heart muscle as well. Um, you know, and again, uh, you know, uh, the, the vast majority of cases of vaccine related myocarditis um, are, are, are short stays in the hospital, but they're not generally no stays in the hospital. So for, um, uh, you know, these are, you have to see what the extent of damage is uh, in, in terms of checking these enzyme levels, also have to get a sense of um, what the heart muscle dysfunction may be. And more, more importantly, when you're going in the throes of the acute event, uh, you know, there is a small percentage of folks who end up severely ill, needing like critical care and needing IV drips and stuff. So, and you don't know if that's going to happen to your child or not. So, you know, so yeah, you know, I've seen some, I think there's one PhD who is very confident about treating myocarditis, <laughs> who, who yeah. writes about, you know, myocarditis, give, you know, Motrin and Motrin and stay at home or something like that. It's not, not a big deal. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But, but no, and, and, you know, yeah, but you just don't, you just can't predict. So I, I, I urge anyone listening that, you know, if you have a severe chest pain after, um, after getting a vaccine, you really do need to be evaluated in the ER, unfortunately. Um, so we can figure out one, uh, how much damage there is, and, and two, you want to, you need to be monitored for monitored for a little period of time to make sure you're not one of those f- few people that end up needing more significant care to, you know, which is kind of life sustaining. Um, all right, so, so Aiden, you, when you went in the hospital, right, was uh, how 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 did that all? Have you, I mean, you've been to the ER, I imagine, for asthma attacks, I guess. Unfortunately, I don't believe. So. I know my brother has for sure. Okay, but you have not. I don't believe so no my asthma is usually something like either I remember we either had colds or I could just be remembering it wrong and just infectious pneumonia okay but it developed into pneumonia from just the smallest things I I don't think I've had to go to the hospital my brother was young so this is your this was your first as you can recall uh, uh visit to the ER Yes, I believe how, so. Yeah. So how did how did the uh, how did we do? How did the hospitals? Uh, how did the it ER do? It was yeah. pretty good. Um, we got in to the lobby pretty quick. They admitted us like a f- few minutes, even seconds later. Really? Was, yeah. Okay. Um, from my recall, they did some basic doc uh che- checks you do at the doctor, like height and weight. Yeah, maybe blood pressure. I'm not. It's kind of fuzzy. I don't recall yeah. everything because it's kind of a busy day. Then they admitted me into a room. I remember I got a shot or um, a needle in my arm for like IVs and stuff. I I don't know the name. Like it's blinking yeah. on me right okay. now. And then they had several nurses come in. Uh, I believe one of the checks was I don't the imaging on the heart where they have this. Mm-hmm stick on you yeah they did that and then they decided yeah um we should admit him to the cardiatric unit i, I don't think i'm saying that right okay but, um, oh, boy. all right that was at like evening time ish five i'd say five six okay. that time so i was probably in like that room for at least like six hours like okay. there was a lot of stuff happening were you um yeah yeah no we'll get mom to fill in the detail i'm sure mom has like a crystal clear memory of every (laughs) single minute of that day um aiden were you pretty was it a pretty scary experience did you feel like um something bad was happening or you you think that doctors and your mom are so i'm naturally pretty calm in those kind of scenarios ironically enough i probably get more nervous of our school test than anything so i wasn't too scared i was kind of just zoning out I don't know if I was just trying and tired or hungry or something, but I wasn't too scared. I mean, I've been to doctors a lot. I'm just the we- I have many weird thing, random things. So it's kind of just, I kind of just zoned out. And and you zoned out for the entire hospitalization. And then when how many days were you in the hospital? Or so the next days was more so. Uh, I stay in bed. Uh, periodic tests, either like. They take my blood in the morning, yeah. check the um, troponin, mm-hmm. and 
I remember I had MRI, I probably more heart imaging, and I had the um, stickers as well. Mm-hmm. And that was about it. I was allowed to chill uh, in bed for most of the time. So that part wasn't too bad because the Motrin did stave away the pain. I probably got luckier with pain since I caught it earlier. Okay. But um, yeah, it wasn't nearly as chaotic as the first day. Okay. So you, you, you had Motrin that was helping with the pain. They were doing a bunch yeah. of diagnostic tests and then, and then eventually yeah. they, they, uh, they, sent you, uh, they sent you home. Yeah, I think okay. the biggest concern was that like, uh, they needed to monitor and also ensure I didn't like exercise much, you know, aggravate it, make it worse. Okay. So they just ensured that and it was good. Uh, they took good care of me as well. Good. How, how, so, so is this, did this whole thing interfere with your, with your daily functioning? Uh, sorry, with your, you know, uh, is there things that you uh, haven't been able to do because of all this? So, um, I can't, I couldn't exercise for the first few months, which for many would be awful, but I'm a naturally kind of (laughs) lazy person, I guess. I I tore my ACL and have asthma, so I've just like kind of given up on sports at this point. I knew my chances are like, I never been too (laughs) fond of them anyway. So it hasn't been too bad, but I could imagine like, seeing as this was month and like a half before school yeah. if someone was doing sports they'd be absolutely screwed and if that was their passion yeah that would yeah. really suck well Aiden thank you so much for uh, your uh, your telling of the story from your, your point so that's it was it was great so I'll let you uh, well Michelle do you have any questions specifically for Aiden or yeah should, uh, can I, we I let just him... want to say that's, oh, that that yeah. uh, yeah it's I don't know if it's the, the gaming or the chair that has made you so articulate and mature <laughs> and intelligent but I'm going to, you know, I wish my parents had uh, given me, you know, uh, allowed me to play video games the way you, the way they have you. And, uh, and uh, I would have turned out. The other thing I want to say is I think, I think, because not every, not every uh, kid gets myocarditis. Yes. I think it really attacks the superstars. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, I, I want to thank you, Aiden. That, that's a wonderful, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great testimony. And, uh, and thank you for sharing it. Yeah. Yes, thank you for having me on. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Thanks, Aiden. Thank you. Have a good night. Yep, you too. All right. So, Emily, right. Um, <laughs> you have a wonderful son there. My God, he's so mature. Um, thank you, he is. Uh, yeah, I know. He's More very, mature and, and, than me. <laughs> yeah, and he has, he, I, I was particularly taken by the fact that, you know, even though he's not, um, you know, he's not uh, uh, playing, you know, uh, uh, he's not on his way to playing Division One uh, college football or something like that, but he still has a you know, the, the insight and the, you know, that empathy to say that, you know, if this had happened to somebody who sports was their passion in life, you know, that uh, this could be a significant, uh, even more significant event than, than, it, than it was for Aiden. So, yeah. Um, so wonderful kid you have there. Thank um, you. So Emily, from your vantage point as a parent, um, um, how, how was, were you, how were you, was it pretty scary to, you know, to know that your child, you know, you're, you're, you've read about this, you, your son probably has it. Um, and, you know, how, how did that first day and how did that whole hospitalization stuff go? Well, like I said, he was joking about it the day before. So the irony is not lost on me, but sometimes I guess the OCD pays off because he knew to come to me right away. Um, it, it was a shock when it yeah. happened. Um, I had to be strong for him and not freak out. So put on my poker face and they did well with that in the ER too, but yeah, you know, they made sure that we recognized the severity too. It was scary. I, and especially as we saw the troponin going up yeah. as his stay progressed, you know, it, it I didn't know what was going to happen. Right. And and I had read about it. Like I said, I, I don't think most people knew about it. My friends who have boys of similar age were shocked. They, yeah. they didn't have a clue. Um, and I, I had told them about it, but you know, so I mean, how, how come you, you kept up with, I mean, you, how were you aware of the, I mean, how did you keep up? It, it sounds any, any medical background, either with you or your husband or, or people in the family, or, or you just out of interest with this pandemic, you became 
you know, an expert like like many people who are more expert than the experts. <laughs> I'm not an <laughs> expert, but I have degrees in microbiology and biochemistry, molecular biology. So I, it's interesting to me. So I follow science on Twitter and the vaccine rollout was interesting to me. And of course, with kids this age, mm -hmm. this was something I was following. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and when, when you heard about it, did you have any uh, twinge of uh, hesitation about the vaccine or what, what, uh, what crossed your mind? I mean, you just trusted what you, you mentioned that you asked you the pediatrician. And then was it like, OK, you know, very small chance, you know, what's 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 the big deal? Well, I, I think I recognize that with any medical treatment, there's right. risk. So I believed that the reward would outweigh the risk and i believe that it was a small risk you never think you're going to be that one which i'm seeing it's not as small in this demographic but um yeah you don't but, ever think it's gonna be you right so now no, knowing this i mean w would it uh, would it have made any difference if you had if you, if you knew what the data the current data is now do you think it would have um, changed your mind? I mean, you still have a kid who has asthma, right? I mean, who potentially could have uh, more severe complications from, from COVID. In what way would the, would the knowledge of um, this complication would have factored into your decision? So that's an interesting question, because in Twitter, you get in your echo chambers, right? Mm -hmm. So I was in one that was very vaccinate everybody it's safe so i don't know if i hadn't kind of been removed from that echo chamber if i would still be following that kind of thinking that it's safe for everybody instead of stratifying it by demographics so I, i'm not sure to be honest with you i'm not sure if i would have been exposed to it or if i would have believed still that the reward would outweigh the risk now I have a 12 year old and I'm holding off a 12 year old son too. I understand. Right. And your 12 year old has, it sounds like that his asthma, his uh, son, sorry, sorry, his asthma is actually more severe. It is more severe. Yes. Okay. And all right. So, you know, the um, really interesting, you know, the, the thing that I've told um, trainees over, over time um, is that you never want to let you know, a single bad event necessarily change your entire practice. Uh, so, you know, a, lot, a big thing that cardiologists face all the time is, you know, a 44 year old coming with, say, chest pain, right? And, you know, we always have to make this judgment about oh, how extensively to work up that 44 year old who's now in the ER with chest pain. There's obviously lots and lots of things that are benign, uh, well, relatively speaking, benign that can cause chest pain. But, you know, of course, we're all looking for, you know, is this a a near coronary occlusion or a coronary occlusion, right? And so, um, you know, you are, and I've told, <laughs> I've told many a training in the past that you are not, you, you can't be a good cardiologist and aim to have a zero miss rate, okay? Because if you have a zero miss rate, that means that you are doing a massive amount of testing on every Tom, Dick, and Harry right. um, and Jane that is coming in, in the door. So, even if so, I, I and I tell this to residents usually when they're like you know uh, trainees when they're trying when they're kicking themselves about oh you know this we missed this diagnosis or missed that diagnosis and it's like oh go back and look and see if this was really something that you should have done differently the outcome should not dictate necessarily whether or not you did the right thing diagnostically right if you decided clinically that this person is low risk for whatever then no you shouldn't have worked them up. Um, and all because the outcome is now, if you missed something, right, if you missed some key port, part of the data that would have changed the clinical picture of this particular patient, then that's a different story. But, but yeah, I mean, in your case, just to echo what Michelle is saying, um, you know, I don't know that, you know, I don't know that in May of 2020, where the data is, the data is still forming, we know that the second dose is has this rate of microdite associated with it. We don't know the exact rate. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know that you can necessarily uh, second guess that decision, honestly, because I think, you know, you, I, I, your son said it beautifully. 
he's high risk. He, you guys, you know, you're clearly really worried about COVID and you're really staying at home and really changing a young person's life. And the vaccine at the time promised this ability to now resume normal life. Now, a lot of things in what I just said have, of course, changed, right? <laughs> Meaning, yes. yeah, so so it just goes to show you how difficult um, these decisions really are. And, and you are really flying blind. And, and you know, I, and even I kind of, and, and all of us as doctors are learning about this too. So I now looking back at that, that large, those large vaccines, I must have vaccinated 600 or 700 people. And yeah, I was not probably at the time appropriately giving them a real sense of the fact that we are a little flying blind. This is new. You know, um, there are, there may be adverse events that, that, you know, we will find out later um, that we don't know about. So, um, so yeah, no, it's a very, very difficult. Uh, the whole thing is incredibly difficult. Um, uh, do you, um, uh, what, so in, in terms of your thinking, I'd love to hear your thinking in terms of um, how you've decided for your 12 year old based on what happened. Um, how, what are the things that go into that decision for you? Well, I, as you said, we were, promise that this essentially was a sterilizing sort of vaccine, which I took with trepidation knowing the sort of virus. I didn't really think that was a possibility, but I was hopeful and trusting. And um, so I'm not sure that we would have done it again if I had known that it it's going to be endless number of doses, that sort of thing. So now we're knowing that in conjunction with the myocarditis. And it gives me pause, of course. And I don't think I could physically drive him after what happened. I, I couldn't do it. Yeah. We were also advised not to by um, Aiden's cardiologist. Oh, OK. So well, what did he say about why that, that was? Um, to be honest with you, he feels pretty generally about not vaccinating kids is what he, I, I'm sure that there's exceptions. Specifically with co for the COVID-19 vaccine. This saying, only, okay. right. Yeah. Yes. I, I mean, he made sure flu. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Got, yeah. We're right, not, right. we've had every vaccine. <laughs> right. <laughs> and we were one of the first out of the gate with this. So, um, his recommendation was not to. My pediatrician is, um, or their pediatrician is, she's in the middle. She wants, you know, she's deferring to the cardiologist, but she's also dealt with my son's respiratory complications. Right. So she, you know, she thought about, I, I discussed the lower dose. She would do yeah. it off label. And okay. she said she would when I'm ready. And okay. she's basically anything to get him <laughs> Right, vaccinated right. but i'm not ready yeah so you know i forgot to ask i meant to ask when aiden came up so but let me uh, uh did aiden have to go to the critical care unit yeah he was in the um acute cardiac unit on telemetry um okay yeah do you know okay do you know <laughs> if it was the critical care unit or was it just a telemetry unit it was they had an acute cardiac unit. an acute cardiac unit. okay mm -hmm. all right but he and he was on telemetry and it was it was a private room basically that he had. He never required any type of IV drips to maintain his blood pressure and his heart rate was okay and all that. Um, his EKG was abnormal. I okay. don't and it was abnormal pretty much until yeah. discharge. Yeah. I don't recall the heart if okay. the, his heart rate was abnormal. Okay. I think I was focused on the troponin. I used yeah. to work in the ER. Okay. And I know when troponin comes back high, that's a bad thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I know enough to be yeah. scared, but not enough to really understand what was right. going on. But I knew that troponin should never be there. Yeah. Um, I know some I know some details from the case from some methods that we send back and forth. I know his peak troponin was actually 2.0. This is the old generation um, uh, cardiac troponin, not the high sensory troponins we have now. So, um, so his peak troponin was 2.0. I know that he had a echocardiogram. Did the echocardiogram um, show any any damage to the heart? No, okay. thankfully it did yeah. not. So great. Silver lining there. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And then the cardiac MRI. Um, now he just had one cardiac MRI. He had a cardiac MRI initially, and then he had a second one afterwards. He had uh, the initial one. Then he went back for an echo. 
two okay. weeks later okay. and EKG okay. um, and troponin. Okay. So, yeah. And the cardiac MRI, I know from looking from from what you've sent me, was basically reported as normal, no scar. That's right. Excellent. So, and, and interestingly, one only one uh, there was a study that was presented to the um, to the FDA um, as part of their safety eval for the for some vaccine dose. I forget for which one, but sorry for some demographic. I forget which one it was. But you know, it, what's reported by by them is that a third of patients with vaccine related myocarditis end up having scar on the MRI. We don't know what the long term significance of that scar is. Um, but luckily, Aiden is not one of those folks who, who has a scar in his MRI. So that's fantastic. Now, yeah. you recently had some follow up and there was a little bit of a scare. Um, and I think this is what prompted me to ask you to come on, because, you know, one of the uh, one of the misnomers here and, uh, you know, I'm going to we're going to be accused. You're accused regardless of what you do in this whole space, because it's so emotional. But one of the things that I think the other side, I wish there were on other sides, but I know. the other side does is to really try to minimize this a tremendous amount. It, you know, there's a, that, that PhD who's a good friend of yours, I'm, I'm being sarcastic, who, who basically, you know, implies that you, you can just take a Motrin and stay at home. Um, but, yes. but, you know, you've had, this has been going on since May of 2020 for you, right? And yes, there was that acute scare where you don't know what's going to happen. You know, in, in, in the case series that was reported um, uh, out of the CDC today from JAMA of the 1600 or some cases um, that CDC confirmed myocarditis, um, there were 12 patients that required a, to, a cardiac critical care unit uh, where they needed these inotropes or you know drips basically to maintain blood pressure. That means these were kids with very unstable conditions, uh, unstable vital signs that required you know some pretty serious stuff. There were two of the kids that ended up on a ventilator. So again, this is rare. Um, you know, of that the 1,600 cases of confirmed myocarditis that's reported to VAERS that the CDC reviewed, 12 required, um, you know, the drips. Two required mechanical ventilation. But you don't know as a as a parent of a child with myocarditis if that's going to be, you know, your kid's fate or not. So I can imagine it's incredibly scary, and it's no, you know, if some if some. Uh, uh, you know, flippant cardiologists were to come in, I don't think there are, are flippant cardiologists who are clinically busy, but if someone were to come in and say, oh, it's very rare, everything is going to be fine, we just won't do that because we would never want to tell you that, hey, everything's going to be fine. We're trying to frame this as, all right, we hope things are going to be good, things can get very bad. These are not comforting words that any parent of a child in the emergency room or in some cardiac unit wants to hear. So this is even in that acute phase, incredibly scary. It like shaves years off your life. Like, you know, so, so, so that's not good. But then it's not just beyond it. It's not that, okay, then you go home and then everything is fine and dandy, right? You've been, you've been having, you know, this has been going on for some time. So you recently had a visit with a physician. Um, yeah. and, and tell me a little bit about, you know, what, what happened on that visit with your general pediatrician who was reviewing some, some other reports and stuff. Um, there was concern about his spirometry and his lung capacity. And um, also because he had, I'm trying to think of, I'm not in medicine, so I have to think of it, uh, low stroke volume and um, low VO2, but more from conditioning their thinking. She was concerned that he's higher risk now for COVID complications. The irony of that, which really kind of pissed me off, to be honest with you. Um, and I, you and I had talked about this. You said for him to eat alone and go to online school if he could. And it was really just like a... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, a big blow, you know, or how long after the initial thing and to hear that was just right. I, you as know. I recall, right. And, and as I recall, sorry, I'm putting you on the spot for these medical things, oh, but no, you, you know, he had a Aiden had a VO2 max study done and mm -hmm. and uh, and the VO2 max study was, you know, wasn't quite percentage wise up to the normal or whatnot. And and, and those things can represent many different things. It, it, again, again an, sorry, ex explain, explain what the VO2 max, because this is a cardiac test. We just talked about spirometry a, a second ago. So 
Right, right. So, so clarify VO2, for the audience. For the right, audience. a VO2 max right. is a study where you're basically running on a treadmill and you're monitoring, um, uh, you know, uh, you're monitoring the, um, the gases that are being uh, exhaled and it's looking for what's called your anaerobic threshold. It, and it's a way, um, it's a complicated uh, word, but it's basically looking to see how fit you are. All right. So, you know, um, uh, these these bicyc bicyclists that, that that do the Tour Le Monde or whatnot, they have like insane VO2 maxes that are crazy. And, you know, slugs like me and Michelle will have VO2 maxes that are much lower. These are all age, you know, age and sex uh, stratified in terms of giving you what normal values are. So Aiden, you know, and you need some testing done before you can say, okay, you're okay and resume regular stuff. And Aiden's case, and, and the scale of myocarditis. Myocarditis is a bad thing. Myocarditis is not, I don't think anyone before 2020 would ever have said myocarditis is mild. <laughs> myocarditis is a bad thing because it results in a troponin leak and cardiac damage in like a young child. I mean, this is not something that's, that we would right. consider mild. But in the cases of myocarditis, we're just, just looking at myocarditis, Aiden actually had a relatively mild case of myocarditis, okay? Yes. So within myocarditis, he had a mild case. His troponin peak was two. Most cardiologists know that that's a pretty small number and should hopefully not result in any long-term stuff. His cardiac MRI was normal. But despite all that, before, you know, before anyone can say, okay, Aiden, you're fine and everything is okay, you know, you will typically do some type of testing to make sure everything is okay longer term. So you will typically do some type of rhythm monitors to make sure you're not having a lot of arrhythmias. And you will do some type of some treadmill testing or whatnot. In this case, someone decided to do a VO2 max, maybe because of the lung history, I'm not sure. And because Aiden has asthma and, and he's not, you know, division one <laughs> athlete bound, um, you know, he probably had a VO2 max that was some percentage of what was normal for a kid his age, which then made his pediatrician say, oh my goodness, is this, is, is this making him high risk for COVID? Which I, as you're saying, must be incredibly maddening here you've driven your son to get a vaccine. He's had an adverse event from it. He's had the vaccine. And now you're saying that like the vaccine isn't even protective and now he's higher risk. And now he has to eat alone in school and do all these, do all these things. So we, we right. talked. And so again, you were, I could tell you were very upset and you put out a couple tweets there saying, you know, for all the people who are minimizing this, like, look at what, look at what I'm me and, you know, my family and, Aiden is still going through and you know his life is is his life like inextricably altered and stuff and I think that's when we exchange the messages that say why don't we wait to see what the I, I'm pretty sure the pulmonologist is going to look at that vo2 max and all this other data and not necessarily say um you know Aiden has to do uh, you know has to change his life for any significant period of time and you were right <laughs> yeah. so the thank thank goodness yes. um so, but, but again, this is all, I mean, this is tremendously anxiety provoking and stuff. And, oh, yeah. and, and this is a very stressful event for a very long time. We're talking, we're, we're in like March of, or we're just, sorry, January of uh, uh, 20, uh, end of January, 2022. Beyond that, right? There is a financial issue, correct? Oh, yeah. um, it is very expensive. So, but what, so tell me, tell me a little bit about how, about what that uh, story has been. So, Vaccines are normally covered under VICP, which right. is the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. I've learned way too much about this. Mm -hmm. um, this one is under a loophole under CICP, which has denied, I think, 94% of claims historically. And there's no appeal process. That was before the COVID vaccine. 100% of claims have been denied with the COVID vaccine. So, yeah. So, so just, just to clarify, Emily, that means that if you have a medical complication that's related to a vaccine, your insurance typically won't pay for it. And no. it will assume that the fund, uh, one of these, or? So insurance has paid, okay. but when you have a four day stay on the acute cardiac unit, three echoes, a cardiopulmonary stress test, I don't mm -hmm. know how many. Mm -hmm. It adds up whether you have insurance or not. Okay. okay. And it's just the whole, it, it, it's the principle of it. You know, you're told you go, go do this, do your part, do your part. We're all in this together. And then you realize you're screwed <laughs> and yeah. we have insurance, but what about people that don't? Yeah. I mean, I I'm thinking broader than just us. Yeah. I think it's an injustice. Yeah. 
and that I'm fighting for. I've, I'm, I've have have a congressional inquiry into his case. I think a lot of lawmakers are not aware of it. Um, so I'm trying to bring attention to it. But as you know, um, that kind of information is sort of suppressed in the media and on Twitter. I was censored on Twitter just for sharing his story. I don't know if you remember that. It, it's been quite a eye-opening but, experience. So before you get that, so can, can, are, you, are we allowed to know like what this has cost? I mean, has all of it been oh, covered yeah. by insurance? So or? no. Well, no. yes, so- they have not denied anything. Now, recently we did get um, a form asking what caused his injury. So I don't know if that's going to change Mm-hmm. anything okay but that's between them and okay hhs to me if that happens <laughs> <laughs> i'm out of that you yeah. they can take care of that yeah but yes insurance has paid its part i think i, I have a stack of bills right now i think we're close to ten thousand out of pocket really so even with insurance yes close you are to close to ten thousand dollars out of pocket i'm including like the pulmonology follow-up which you should yeah when and and <laughs> that um was that in january that's gonna cost a lot because that was at the beginning and you know so yeah it all adds up and i think uh i don't i'm not sure something was out of network of course lovely but yeah so okay my it, goodness my goodness so too. so with with insurance uh, you're, you're looking at ten thousand dollars out of pocket. My Close word. Close to that. It, Close it, to it, that. Yeah, <laughs> I understand. No, it doesn't have to be exact. Yeah. And I, that's and, it. And, and what is clearly a vaccine injury? The 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 vaccine. So it, it may not. I mean, I I don't know how many people who are listening don't know this, but um, that you know you are not allowed to sue vaccine manufacturers for adverse events that happen from vaccines. And this this was something that was actually put in place because. Um, the the malpractice industry um, uh, was threatening to put vaccine manufacturers out of business because it was so the the, the litigation that can come from vaccine related adverse events can be so significant, not necessarily. And and then this is because of the number of people that are given vaccines. And then there's some percentage that have could, could have some event that happens afterwards. The causal connection is difficult. And the way med malpractice normally works they don't work that hard to figure out a causal connection they're just like oh this happened this happened you seem sympathetic here's 100 million dollars <laughs> i'm not joking and that's and i mean i have massive problems with how the med- medical malpractice industry works it, mm-hmm. it works anyway that, that's a whole different topic but so because of that <laughs> because of this broken med mal system we have um the vaccine manufacturers basically threatened to pull out of manufacturing vaccines. And since the federal government can't really do anything, they don't really have the know-how or ability and, you know, they're relatively incompetent. Um, they were, you know, they were terrified because they're, they're not going to make a vaccine. And so they right. basically created this, this program, the vaccine, uh, what is it? The vaccine injury compensation program, VICP, mm-hmm. um, to, which was a no fault system, which was funded by the vaccine manufacturers. So, uh, so I, I forget how much. Some some percentage of every vaccine uh, that they get, of every little money they get for each vaccine, goes to fund this program. Okay, and so there's this large pot of money that is supposedly sitting there. And if you can establish in a impartial to an impartial panel, I guess that the vaccine caused this injury, you are then you know um, you can get you know compensation for that. Um, if I've I gotten that part right, yes. And um, oh, go ahead. So you, so you, so you contacted a lawyer, I imagine. Many, and <laughs> many, and you can, many, and, wow. um, and they don't take calls for this. They are really? not. Yes, they have. Wow. They said they will take your name and number, and they will get back to you if um, the possibility of litigation opens up. But there is none. So they suggest you file the CICP p- paperwork, which I did. Mm-hmm. Um, but luckily, I was just sitting around one evening and got a phone call. 
And it was an attorney. Uh, he personally called me and he is frustrated about this. He's getting phone calls from patients. He's a vaccine attorney. And he sympathized with me and said if I needed any help or guidance along the way that he would do it pro bono. I mean, he's there's nothing he can get out of this. So he's been wow. advising me. Yeah, really nice guy. Um, mm. And he's the one who kind of taught me about what the VICP and CICP. And he told me that the causation is so clear in Aiden's that if it was any other vaccine, they wouldn't even, it wouldn't go to court. It would just be that open and so, so what is happening specifically with this that is like where, where along the usual path for you getting compensation are things getting stuck? Like, like what's the problem here? So the paperwork is at CICP. And like I said, they've denied 100% of COVID claims. So Ooh, I'm at CICP? CICP. That's what the that countermeasures, I think. And is that because of uh, the exception, the exceptional ways under which, by, you know, through which the uh, these COVID vaccines have been developed and authorized and whatnot, that it now mm -hmm. falls under this special fund as opposed to the VICP? I believe it's the EUA um, okay. that initially right. put it there, but I don't understand why now that it's in some age groups, we've gone to full authorization, right? Full approval. It's still not covered. So I don't know the loophole there. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure it has to do with something that they knew there were going to be a certain amount of adverse events. I, I don't mean to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but there you cannot sue them. It's like ironclad. There's nothing you can do. So that's frustrating too. It's like adding salt to the wound. But again, I mean, the the, the lawsuit is, um, you know, I mean, would would imply that they they were aware that they knew of uh, these these, um, uh, and they covered up. Perhaps I mean, I don't know to what extent. Uh, to be able to win a lawsuit, you have to make the case that they covered up some known side effect. And you know, I, I don't know that there's any evidence. To suggest that that the manufacturers knew that uh, Pfizer and Moderna knew that myocarditis is uh, um, a complication. I mean, I think every manufacturer of any drug is not held liable for things that are discovered, you know, post marketing. Uh, but again, I'm not I'm not I'm not an attorney, so I don't know all these all the nuances there. Um, yeah, I don't think they covered up necessarily. But I don't think they care as much as they should because there's nothing you can do. They, I mean, right. they have nothing to lose. Right. We right. have everything that, that's correct. to lose. Correct. Yeah. That's, that's a bigger problem. That, yeah. that uh, once once they have this guarantee or this immunity, then um, as a manufacturer, they don't they don't really care. Right. I mean, I, I I think the trials were small, but from what I understand, that's pretty normal for kids' trials. I don't know. Uh, that's I'm not a, I'm not into that field, but so I'm sure they knew that there would be some adverse reactions, mm -hmm. but I don't think it was a covering up as much as, you know, okay, well, it's right. okay because I mean, I think we're not it's, liable. It's, it's really the, the government has, they should pay because the government is, you know, uh, making this campaign, you know, right. It's, I mean, it's, uh, they're the ones who are responsible for, uh, you know, uh, uh, coaxing everybody to get vaccinated and and uh, and making the claims that it's all safe and all that. You know, I mean, they, they the government is making the, cl the claims for the vaccine manufacturers. So they bear uh, as much responsibility as far as I'm concerned for uh, for these kinds of events. Um, so I agree. Right. Well, as Emily's saying, that's the deal. The deal is that, you know, you do your part. And uh, here we have a system. I mean, literally, I mean, <laughs> for every COVID vaccine that's given, that you're funding the VICP program, and uh, I, you know, I don't. I, I mean, I don't quite understand. I, don't, I mean, they, this. I mean, this should really require. This should really be some investigation at some political level, right? Like, this is what I mean. This is what you said you would do. Exactly. Why are you? Why are you holding this? Why are you holding this up? And, and and Emily's exactly right. I mean, what if there are? What if somebody is uninsured and has this issue? I mean, you were talking about really, really large bills that could be, you know, financially 
uh, could make you financially ins insolvent, um, could affect your credit, could affect future. I mean, it's just, it makes no sense to me for um, the government to, you know, and, and this is not even getting to the issue of, you know, there are people that are seriously talking about making it untenable to kind of be a part of life in certain cities. Um, okay, I mean, so, and, and so you, you feel that strongly about this, that you're going to either make it a mandate or effectively make it a mandate. And then if there's an injury from it, you are you you don't have a you don't have a mechanism to deal with that 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 seems so irresponsible to me on so it's many different so levels wrong. and and it shows so much distrust too like it, why <laughs> why right, don't right. you stand behind your yeah. safe and effective product right so emily what what do you um what do you think of uh the reception you have gotten like so you this happened this happened in june right and yes. you know you're somebody that has been on social media and stuff at the prior and and you know number one when you brought this up to your initial bubble you said you were in a bubble before right when you did you bring this up to them and what happened was this a facebook group or is it twitter or ha like ha what what happened when you it brought was, it up to your 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 group actually somebody in your group saw my post and my sent me a message <laughs> i would oh. say your group Oh. And um, kind of opened up the, the exposed me to so, sort of what is going on in your group, <laughs> which oh. is, um, and has been actually I'll, I'll just say angry cardiologist. He's been really helpful to me. Yeah. Um, he saw me comment on another cardiologist post and just was curious about. Um, yeah, he posted it. Um, about why I got Aiden vaccinated and what kind yeah. of the kind of questions you were asking me, but he's also been really helpful to me. So right. that's how it kind of. Right. No, no, but yeah, but how, but how did you, but, but you said you were in a, in a bubble before in terms of vaccine and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, did you echo feel. Chamber. An echo yeah, chamber. In the echo right. chamber. That's right. That was oh, the they word. have pushed, they, they have called me an anti-vaxxer they've all turned on me with the exception of a few um well, you know they don't believe me he had to have had covid first um lie i've been called every name in the book by people that i'm like wow you know i was just posting a picture of my kid getting vaccinated and you're loving it and then i posted he gets myocarditis and all of a sudden i'm this evil person yeah. it's been very eye-opening and having my you know account censored all what was your account like, censored for i have no idea <laughs> um I, I think somebody went through and reported all of my posts and so they said everything was um what's the word sensitive content and uh, every post was that way i went back and forth with them and they were like um, just to be safe, you know, we don't want misinformation. We're going to flag your post. Yeah. That was for months. Finally, wow. it got removed. But I what got you the say? right. Were you, say, were you saying this is my experience, folks? You know, this is not completely benign. You, you need to be aware that uh, what, what was the. Yeah, gist I was, were, uh, I guess, were... sorry, pushing against the agenda that they were hearing, which is you take Motrin. Which is true. You do take Motrin and the acute phase resolves in the hospital under monitoring with testing um, and then follow up for months and months and months. They leave all of that out. Yeah. So I wanted to make sure that people know myocarditis in itself is not mild. So yeah. you may have a mild case of something that is not mild. And right. that is what I didn't understand. <clears throat> Yeah. So I want other parents to understand that I'm not telling anybody what to do, but I don't feel like I had informed consent at all. Yeah. And I feel like if I can provide that to other people. Yeah. That's and that's part of that. And you're right. That's part of that mistrust because I mean, again, I, you know, things are developing so rapidly that, uh, you know, it was, it's hard to, it, it's hard, to, it's hard. It was hard to do. And like, February, March, when the vaccines have come out, you're trying to get these vaccines in as many arms as possible and stuff. But certainly, as time has gone on, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm really, 
a little concerned about uh, uh, practitioners that are providing vaccines, whether it would be pharmacists or be nurse practitioners or doctors or, or what have you. And they really need to be up on up on this and understand, you know, how to kind of talk patients through this, right? Because mm-hmm. I, I don't, th- and you're not at all. I know I followed you pretty, you know, a fair amount the last, uh, uh, you know, many months. And you're not at all against children getting vaccinated. Um, I think you're about there being a conversation about this and then allowing parents to make, you know, uh, an informed decision, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, with, you know, with their, with their doctor, right? Um, exactly. Yeah. Um, but what? I don't think they should be disillusioned about <laughs> what myocarditis is. Right, right, and, right. And especially for boys in my son's age group. Right. I mean, well, th- that being said, you know, I mean, what's interesting, I mean, of course, we know a lot more now than what we did back in May, June. And now we know, for example, that uh, the vaccine doesn't stop transmission. And and you can still get, as you said, it's not, uh, it doesn't provide, um, uh, it's not a sterilizing vaccine. It doesn't, you know, uh, people can still get infected and so forth. Um, but... Um, I think it's particularly important for for young, healthy kids uh, mm-hmm. to know about this. And, and that's where I think the, the public health messaging has been completely wrong because it's, uh, it wants to, to use kids, uh, even healthy kids who are at very, very zero, I mean, would be at much lower risk of any kind of complications from COVID. That may not actually be the case for Aiden or your other child, um, but for other kids, who uh, you know, for whom the risk of myocarditis, especially if they're if they're male, you know, boys, uh, would be greater than than the risk of uh, any kind of complication from, from COVID, and um, and and that's not um, that remains um, uh, sort of very um, um, uh, uh, poorly advertised or, or that angle. Let me ask you another thing, Emily. I, is there a difference between getting a complication from? Um, something that's you know a natural occurrence like a virus or something else versus a complication from uh, a vaccine that has been you know advised or or you know that for which you, you've been advised that you you know or your child has been advised to take is the injury a little bit different i mean let's say if physically or biologically you get you get the same sort of insult to the body um does it make a difference if it's if it's a complication from uh, you know if it's man-made versus if it's uh uh, a natural occurrence? Of course. I mean, I'm always going to question my role in this. Mm-hmm. I drove my son. I signed the consent forms. Um, I knew there was a signal, but I, mm-hmm. you know, I'm keeps me up at night, to be honest with you, that I made the wrong choice, but I did the best with what I knew. So, yeah, I think it's a there's a psychological component when it's not a natural occurrence, when you had some kind of you feel like you had a hand in it. Right. Yeah, Yeah. this is right. I mean, it's a point that I made. We had uh, Dr. Paul Offit on on the show um, a couple of months ago and we were talking about, you know, you know, I mean, he's very much, you know, pro vaccines in general. Interestingly, he's not uh, so much in favor, at least of boosters for 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 younger uh, boys and people but but i made the point that uh, for some people it makes a difference you know where you accept you know having a complication from something that's naturally occurring and you're less willing to accept it for something that is uh, man-made or, or manufactured and whatnot and that seems to me like a a reasonable distinction to make mm-hmm. right I agree. do you did you um what, what do you think the response if I we can get a summary from you, because you know you kind of sit outside of the uh, the med Twitter world, um, how would you gauge the 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 overall response from from medical folks to what you've been through and and this issue in general? Um, a few have been nice. I've been blocked by many that, and I I you've seen me. I can be snarky and sarcastic but it's only usually in return but i will ask legitimate questions and get blocked um by many some i've called out and they've apologized which i respect you know about um 
I don't know. Can I specifically talk about the professor? Sure. Okay. <laughs> so there was a Dr. Blake who's in Augusta. So I'm in Atlanta, um, Medical College of Georgia. And he was saying, consistently downplaying myocarditis. And he's not a physician. I don't, he needs to stay in his lane, I feel like, first of all. And that's dangerous to say that because I've met boys throughout this journey, their parents, the kids have been on IVIG, um, one was in ICU. So you, you don't tell people to take Motrin. That's a slippery slope. Um, yep. So I reached out to his employer, <laughs> which I am not a doxing kind of person. I did it in a respectful way, just saying that this is dangerous and he should not be putting this kind of information out there. And he's not going to be anymore, thankfully. So I'm not loved probably by a lot of people in med Twitter, but that's, that's, I think I make them uncomfortable. Yeah. Do you think they have a point in that they feel that, um, you know, you've seen all these uh, tragic pictures of children severely ill with, you know, pneumonias, uh, you know, from COVID. Uh, do you think that there's a, if, if your story, which is a real story, <laughs> Aiden's right. real, uh, what Aiden went through is real, what you're currently going through is real. But if that story um, results in, uh, say, far fewer children getting vaccinated, and because of that, you have these other tragic tales playing out, it, do they have a point in saying that, you know, we should not be uh, uh, making too much of cases like, like Aiden? Um, so I think I have a big problem with it's, it's so rare. They don't want to talk about it. It's so rare. Well, they also COVID complications are rare. So within healthy children and children in general, I understand that they're looking at the bigger picture, but they need to look at individuals too. So I do get, you know, but they see more complications from COVID, but it shouldn't diminish the complications from the vaccine either. And yeah. I think that sows distrust too, and they can't have an open conversation about it. Right. Yeah. And I think the fundamental thing is, is that they don't want to leave that they, they, they want to make sure there isn't choice in the matter. Right. And I think right. that's partly what drives this great desire to minimize one thing and maximize other things, you know? So, so the, the kind of scrutiny that, that uh, uh, vaccine related myocarditis or vaccine related adverse injuries face is, 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 is like, you know, ridiculous compared to say the amount of uh, uh, dissecting and analysis that happens of COVID related long COVID for instance, right? I mean, I mean, you know, literally if COVID, you know, if there's a case of like, you know, a, uh, a toe being, um, uh, being uh, uh, amputated uh, uh, after, you know, because a train runs over it or something like that. And, 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 the, and, and you know, the, the, the patient had COVID two weeks ago, somebody could write a case report and be like, oh my God, COVID causing toe to be amputated. And, you know, and there'd right. be a bunch of folks, I feel like on social media amplifying and be like, oh my God, COVID, 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 and look, look what it did. Right. And, you know, it's like, wait, that was an anecdote. And, and it, it was the train that ran over the toe and that's why the toe fell off and it had nothing to do with COVID. <laughs> no, that, you know, it's like, it doesn't matter. But my goodness, if, if you, if you, if you, if you come with anything that the vaccine is causing some, maybe causing some issue, holy cannoli, you have to like present like, you know, like a scanning electron, mic, uh, you know, uh, uh, microscopy of, of, of the COVID virus affecting the cardiac muscle. Otherwise, it's not believable. Or oh, sorry, right. the vaccine, sorry, the vaccine antibody affecting the uh, myocardial is not believable. So, um, <laughs> and, and, and I think you're absolutely right, Emily. I mean, I think I can, I can sense from you, you know, the anger and the frustration and and that's what that's what that, that, I mean. This is going to drive um, fo uh, hesitancy for folks to get vaccines. So I really think this is a mistake that many establishment slash public health slash you know uh, know it all uh, you know bureaucrat authoritarians are kind of making here. That in in, in having this kind of uh, um, uh, you know uh, black and white view of things where. You know, they say you cannot, we cannot entertain, you know, 
people like Emily and Aiden, right? So we must right. we must kind of you know put the covers over them and and keep them quiet because you know overall we have to end this. And 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 and, and Michelle is completely right. At the end of the day, <laughs> sitting in January of you know almost February of 2022, we uh, it's pretty clear that you know um, the vaccines, even if you're vaccinated, boosted, etc., um, you know you are not going to make this a zero. Uh, case event. We're, this is we're, so you know. So then, it, it, you know, that's a conversation that we just have to have, and we have to be open about it. Encourage vaccination for folks that we think are higher risk for kids. That, you know, maybe for kids that are higher risk, right? And and kind of give patients that um, that ability to, to to say to say no if they so choose, even if you've laid out your best case for vaccination. So I think that that that's a really important thing to do, but. That is not on the agenda for many folks. Many folks want to say, "Here's a vaccine. It's safe. Take it," and you know, let, let's uh, let, let's stop arguing about this. So, right. And I I've had thoughts. I mean, what if I cause somebody not to get vaccinated because of the story I present? And I think about that, but then I think. I'm one person where 90% of the information out there is it's Motrin, yeah. it's safe and effective. Yeah. So it, it, it needs to be heard. Yep. And, and I'm not saying do not get vaccinated. I, I do. I, I did say that about the boosters. <laughs> I, I did say that I did not like the way that approval was done or showing any, the benefit. I don't see it being worth it. That's the only area where I said that for boys, I'm boosted. So, you know, I'm obviously not against it. It's so funny. I, I say I'm the thrice vaxxed va anti vaxxer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last question, uh, because we've kept you too long here. Um, who are some, uh, who are some, what are some good accounts that uh, you have that have really, um, you also already mentioned angry cardiologist, um, and he, he has a he has a fantastic account. He's, he's very informative and very balanced and uh, very very smart uh, smart guy that uh, we've interacted a fair amount. Are there other so other? Not angry either. He's yeah, not yeah, angry. He's, not, <laughs> right. he's not so angry either. That's exactly right. Yours, of course, has been. Helpful. Oh, of course, yes. Um, I don't want to say if it's Stefan or Stefan. Yeah. Baral, yeah. SD yeah. Yep. I, I, I so I don't want to do names. Is it Walid? Walid Galad, yes. Yeah, so yeah. so SD Baral, it's at SD Baral, who's a Johns Hopkins epidemiologist, very balanced, very balanced, and has been great. Uh, Walid Galad has been uh, also, you know, been very upfront. He's a he's a very well respected, uh, uh, unlike me and Michelle, very well respected <laughs> academic in uh, at the University of Pittsburgh, who um, who who you know writes who writes a lot and spends a lot of time on analysis of studies and stuff and he has been especially um, uh, cogent and clear and uh, uh, about uh, the vaccine and 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 trying to uh, contextualize risk and benefit based on demographics so yep he's been very good who else i'm trying to think i'm kind of like scrolling now because i know i'm gonna leave somebody no, okay. out yeah Th those are the main ones yeah. i'm thinking who i retweet the most is usually um i, I think that's all right that's about it right. there's a, there's i'm sure there's many more yeah but those have been the most helpful to the ones me, that have so. kind of stuck out okay awesome yeah. mm -hmm. fantastic thank emily thanks so much for coming on Thank I really you appreciate for it. having appreciate us. Story. All right. Well, we appreciate it. It's nice uh, seeing tweets in person. Yeah, that, uh, <laughs> well, where, sort of. Can, can you can you give your hand your Twitter handle for people to to follow? Sure. Um, it's e e. I have to look at it. Isn't this awful? <laughs> e e e k y mom. Okay. E, -E mom. E e k y mom. We'll have it on the show. Thank you very much. Everybody. All right. Thank you.